tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 11. I'm your host, <laughs> Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. Hello, friends. It's good to see you again so soon, because it's really only been a week, not that long, because I am as constant as the warm stars and reliable as the rising sun in non-polar regions. Again, I'm your host, Jason... <coughs> Hill. Your... <coughs> host. Oh, man. Woof! Holy shit. Damn. I gotta take it easy on the mushrooms. But, gotta say, I feel like a new man. And we've got some new stories for you this evening. Two of them. To represent the warring dualities of the human condition. This is Jason Hill. And I'm back, baby. Home for the holidays. All right, quick break from the bit. Aside the fact that he did an amazing job, Eric did me a huge kindness taking time to host the show for the last few weeks. Life happens. And if you've been paying attention for the last few years, Horror Hill generally doesn't take breaks. So Eric, thanks again. Back to the bit. You've been listening to the standard edition of this thing. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of whatever it is that this is, and all our other things, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our... Um people we like at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for that thing I mentioned previously. If you go back a little bit, you'll hear it. I guess when I slipped in that pool of amniotic fluid, I must have lost some of my more mundane nouns. Oh well. They'll come to me. I'm already feeling that feeling that's not bad but not quite great. God, fuck. I'm not so hot on adjectives right now either. But hey, at least all my curse words are in place. Fucking A, am I right? <laughs> and to all my little hill heads out there, don't use naughty language. When you do, God casts another angel into the fire. And now, Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies. 
where you can enjoy a nice plate of fries. And if it's early, maybe a warm cup of chives. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, without further ado, from author Raz T. Slasher, I give you a season to dismember. Christmas has always been my favorite time of year. For me, it's never been about the money spent. No. It's about the love and joy you share with those around you. It's about charity and goodwill towards mankind, as the saying goes. But nothing is more important than staying off that dreaded naughty list, though. It began like every other holiday season. Christmas trees and lights were going up, and festive music was dominating every major department store. I was back at the mall with a few friends of mine from work for another round of early shopping. We made our purchases and donations before splitting up and heading to our respective homes. I was living with my partner Stanley at the time and couldn't wait to get home and show him all the early shopping I'd already finished with. He'd been out of town on a business trip for the last week and I wanted to surprise him. I pulled out of my parking lot and headed home, blasting the usual CD of various Christmas songs that I always kept in the car. I made it home just as he was coming in from the airport. Talk about perfect timing. We spent some time hanging out and talking about his trip and what I'd been doing while he was gone. Then we munched the hell out of our dinners, leaving little behind in our ravenous wake. I'd somehow conned him into a relaxing night of laying on the couch and watching Christmas movies. It was one of several little marathons I'd conned him into during the holiday season. The way it worked is that we'd each pick a movie, then pick a third together. I knew I was in for a lot of punishment when he'd chosen the Star Wars Christmas special, but that was nothing that a joint couldn't solve. I decided to get a little payback on him when I chose Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. After a lengthy debate on whether Nightmare Before Christmas was a Halloween movie or a Christmas movie, we settled on it as our collective choice. Listen up, people. The movie starts as Halloween ends and focuses on Christmas. Watching it for Halloween is like when Walmart puts out the Christmas decorations in September. With the popcorn and hot chocolate ready, we'd settled down on the couch to watch the Star Wars Christmas special. We groaned and laughed when it was merited, but after 20 minutes, he regretted the torment that he'd inflicted upon the both of us. By the time it was over, we were both thankful... We stood to stretch and take turns in the bathroom afterward. Then, we got some refills of hot chocolate and popcorn for the next movie. Just as we were settling back in on the couch to continue our little marathon, we both received a push notification on our cells from a news app. It read thusly, A suspect in a Santa costume continues to evade police after murdering eight people with an axe in Dayton, Ohio. The attacks began at the local mall last Sunday and have since continued to private residences throughout the week. Little is known about the suspect, but they are considered armed and dangerous. If you see a Santa engaged in suspicious activity, dial 911 immediately. I was concerned, but Stanley shrugged it off. Nothing we need to worry about tonight. I'm sure the police will catch them soon enough. I sighed and acquiesced. Oh, you're probably right. I'd feel safer if we kept the porch lights on tonight, though. He chuckled faintly and slipped off the couch, moving to the outside light switch and flipping it on. He settled back in next to me, and I got the next movie started. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Oh, it was a truly terrible movie, but it was still better than that damn Star Wars Christmas special. We cuddled up both moaning and groaning in my awesomely terrible movie decision. Well, it was a lot of fun, just spending time on the couch with Stanley. We were both so busy all the time, 
it was nice to finally have some time to ourselves. Just as the movie was ending, we received another alert on our phones. It read as follows. Police are still on the hunt for a person dressed as Santa that's been killing unsuspecting victims with an axe throughout the week. The authorities have discovered additional bodies in nearby Riverside, Ohio, bringing the death toll up to 11. At this time, they appear to be no closer to an arrest. Once again, keep your eyes peeled and remember to dial 911 if you see anything suspicious. Well, that's such a shockwave of fear through me. We lived in Riverside. I hopped off the couch and ran to the front door. I pulled the curtains aside on our front bay window and peered up and down the street. It had started snowing, but there was no sign of anyone milling about. Just the occasional car now and again. While I felt a little better, the fear was still there. Stanley joined me at the window, wrapping his arms around me. We're going to be okay, sweetie, I promise. I balked at that. And how do you know that? I'm sure those 11 people this person has already killed felt exactly the same way. He squeezed me a little tighter. Would it make you feel better if I did a perimeter check just to be sure? I nodded at that, turning to look up into his eyes. Do you think that's wise? I mean... What if that maniac is waiting just outside the door with an axe? He chuckled faintly. Don't you worry, I'll be right back. I was torn between being worried for his safety and being pissed that he wasn't taking this seriously. I followed him to the back door and watched him pull on his coat and walk outside. I followed his progress around the house as best I could, going from window to window to check on him. Ten minutes later... He walked into the back door with a fine coating of snow. He shrugged off his coat and flashed me an award-winning smile. See? Nothing to worry about. No one's even outside at all. I turned on the garage light, though, just to be safe. I nodded at his words, feeling much better about the situation. I turned the TV input over to cable to check the news before we watched our last movie of the night, just to be safe. There was a live news report in progress on Channel 7, so I turned the volume up. There was a woman in a power suit standing in front of a camera outside near the local high school. With the death toll now up to 11, we can only hope there will soon be an end to the madness. Again, we are urging everyone to stay indoors until this person is caught. They were last sighted near Stebbins High School in the Valley Platte area. Police are out patrolling en masse. Stay tuned for more updates. The video went back to the anchor desk at the studio before they moved on to the weather report. I glanced over at Stanley. That's only five blocks away from here. He nodded to me solemnly. Getting close, that's for sure. Um, we just have to do as they advised and stay indoors until it all blows over, I guess. I was on edge. They weren't reporting the names of the victims yet. Suddenly, I realized we forgot to lock the doors. I jumped up and startled Stanley. We have to lock the doors and windows. He swiftly joined me and we split up, locking every door and window on our respective sides of the house. When we were done, we returned to the living room, plopping back onto the couch. Stanley was the first to speak up. I just realized something. I raised a brow at him. Yes? He sighed heavily and jumped to his feet. The door to the basement outside. I left it unlocked earlier. I cringed at that. That door led straight down into the basement, and from there, it was an easy walk up the stairs to the kitchen. Suddenly, we heard a loud crash in the basement, and I darted behind Stanley. Oh, God. What do we do? Stanley grabbed the fire poker from its spot next to the fireplace and cast his gaze towards the kitchen. Stay here. I'm going to check it out. I grabbed one of his arms firmly. Shouldn't we just call the cops? Stanley shook his head. If it's nothing, I don't want to waste their time. They are on a manhunt, after all. 
I still didn't like this train of thought. Not one bit. Shouldn't we at least go together? He sighed and shook his head again. No. If someone is down there, I need you to be ready to dial 911. I suppose that made some sense, but I still didn't like it. Reluctantly, I let go of his arm and watched him creep into the kitchen. I heard Stanley open the door from the kitchen to the basement and lethargically descend the stairs. It was an old staircase. They'd been meaning to update it, and you could easily hear every thump and creak of the boards. I stayed next to the fireplace to give myself some distance. Any moment of time I could buy myself would be more than beneficial if something were to go wrong. I damn near jumped out of my skin when I heard another loud crash from the basement, closely followed by Stanley letting out a scream. Son of a bitch! I screamed back to him. What's wrong? Every millisecond of silence that passed sent fear tingling up my spine. I was moments away from just running down there when he shouted out once again. Just some damn raccoons, babe. But I knew, and I grinned to myself. I turned on the kitchen radio just in time to catch Santa Claus is coming to town. I paused for a moment, thinking it odd that this particular song had been playing at each place I visited. I shrugged it off and pulled the old, blood-drenched axe from the walk-in pantry he never looked in. And wouldn't you know it, I had just enough time to don the old Santa costume too before he made his way back up the stairs. When I saw his head enter the doorway up into the kitchen, I leveled that axe and swung for the fences. Blood and bits of bone exploded all over the frigid air. Stanley had been a very, very naughty boy. I took off the mask and relaxed back into my recliner, flipping the TV back on and turning up the volume. I was just in time for the 11 o'clock news, the male anchor already launching into the top headline. We had been following this story all week. Someone dressed as Santa Claus has been on a blood-filled rampage throughout our town. We can now report the names of some of the victims. The first body was an elderly mall Santa named Eric Balzi. He was found behind the Sears at the Dayton Mall. It's from him we believe the suit was taken. The suit was a little big on me, and I'd had to add a new notch on the fly to tighten the belt around my waist. I distinctly remember the guy smelling of cheap liquor. I'd even noticed him taking money from the collection stand and slipping it into his own pocket. The next few victims have caused big shocks to the local community. A true loss for sure. It was our own Mayor Rydell, his wife Amy Rydell, and his top advisor, Matthew Smith. Mayor Rydell had always been a particularly vicious little man. He was a known racist and bigot. How the man became mayor in the first place was something many of us wondered about. I'd found out just last week that it was due to a series of well-placed bribes that had earned him his lofty position. His wife and advisor weren't any better. I'd eased myself into his home through the back door this past Wednesday after a town hall meeting and waited in his bedroom closet. I caught the three of them engaging in the most depraved sexual activities you can imagine. Needless to say, they were all three very naughty indeed. The next victim was Albert Stone, a local man convicted of rape just last year. A self-explanatory victim, that trial was a notorious one around the area. A few mistakes had been made by the police and the whole case ended up being dismissed. He had taken to strutting around town after that and we all hated him for it. Naughty, naughty, naughty. Multiple bodies were also found at Stebbins High School. 
Their names are Jonas and Evelyn Stark, Jerry Riggers, and Shane Dempsey. Their remains were found in a dumpster in the teacher's parking lot. That had been a tricky one for sure. I caught them behind that building smoking pot and rooting around at the dumpsters over the weekend. They were scourges of the neighborhood, guilty of everything from breaking and entering to extreme animal cruelty. I'd say the four of them were naughtier than most. I lured them to the nearby woods, high out of their little minds, and took my time playing a nice game of cat and mouse. By the time I was done, I had festively painted the nearby pine trees red. The most recent victim was Jimmy Lyman. His remains were found at his apartment. Ah, Jimmy. I took the most pleasure in killing him. This also brings me to Stanley's death. I had proof that the two of them had been engaging in an affair for quite some time now. I lifted a copy of his apartment key from Stanley's office the night he left for his trip. I'd let myself into the apartment and caught him in the shower. Not to be immodest, but let's just say that Norman Bates ain't got nothing on me. And there's nothing quite like watching the blood of a naughty man swirl down the drain. Don't you think? The other victims have yet to be identified. Police are hoping that dental records may be their most useful tool in identifying the remains. We will continue to provide information as it comes in. For now, just continue to remain inside your homes and remain vigilant. I shut off the TV and helped myself to some more hot chocolate. I played my part well, and I was proud of that. I knew I needed to be caught for my plan to work. People needed to understand what happens to naughty boys and girls. I would become a new face of fear, a new reminder of what it meant to dishonor the spirit of Christmas. With that in mind, I sat on the couch and placed an anonymous call to the local police station. I told them that I'd seen someone dressed as Santa, covered in blood, enter my neighbor's house. I gave them my address as the location of the neighbor, of course. For some reason, Santa Claus's coming to town was playing on repeat through my home stereo. Did I forget there was a CD in there, or was there some malfunction with the radio? Either way, I found myself singing along with the music, and was halfway through another repeat of the song, when I heard fists pounding on my front door. I smiled to myself and answered it, happy to see six policemen at my door and eight squad cars surrounding the house. I put on my most pleasant smile as I addressed them. Evening, officers. What can I do for you? One of them looked at me oddly, while the other two tackled me through the threshold. I remember laughing merrily all the way down to the station. I wasn't in a cell for very long before they shipped me here, to the Twin Valley Behavioral Center. That's my story, I suppose. It's a year later, and I still love Christmas. More than ever. A plea of insanity at my trial pretty much guaranteed I'd be staying here for quite some time. It's not all bad here, though. I get to listen to Christmas music year-round and I'm even helping with decorations around the building. I've been making a lot of progress in my treatment, and people are actually starting to trust me around here. How else could I have grabbed this phone off of an orderly and posted this story? Not everyone here is friendly, though. Some are, dare I say it, more than a little naughty. This morning I snuck into the nurse's station... You'd be surprised by the large variety of medications they keep on site. Too many of the wrong combinations could very well leave someone in a defenseless state. I also happen to know which keys the orderlies possess to unlock certain doors. You know, I heard they installed a new emergency fire axe in the security corridor, too. 
It's my turn this evening to make the hot chocolate for the staff and patients. It's part of a new program for those of us that have made the most progress. Sort of a way for us to give back, I suppose. Well, this is the season for giving, after all. And I'm not one to disappoint. It's like Mother Teresa once said. It's not how much we give, but how much love we put into the giving. You've been listening to A Season to Dismember by Raz T. Slasher. So many voices. Screaming. Such terrible, beautiful thing. Oh, whoop, oh, time for the next story. Let's do it. And now, without further ado, from author Ron Reiki, I give you Ambulance means walking, Christmas means dead. My very first Halloween, I wasn't on the schedule. It was my first year as an EMT. I had a calling to attempt to resurrect the dead for minimum wage. I was interested in the busy shifts, but apparently Halloween is one of those days when everybody wants to work. I don't believe in ghosts, but I do believe in drunk drivers. And if you want to see something really horrifying... You want to have a graveyard Samhain shift where after the bars close, everybody starts dying in the most imaginative ways. I don't mean to be gallows, but I wanted to see the worst so I could get hands-on training. The more corpses you get through, the more lives you can save. You only learn by pushing yourself, by working as many Saturdays as you can. If you didn't know, more people die on Saturday than any other day of the week. But the one day of the entire year with the most deaths? That's Christmas. So, I was thrilled when I saw my name listed on the schedule for December 25th. The reason why so many people die on Christmas? It's debatable. Some say people hold off their death until Christmas. Others say it's because that's the day of the year where hospitals are most understaffed. Others say... It's because the air is filled with the supernatural. Where you have angels, you have demons. My partner that night was a demon named Arthur, a thirty-something-year-old grandfather whose entire identity was in the fantasy of his one day being a doctor. Now, he was a lowly EMT. He was always angry, always quiet, always broken by the future. We sat in a parking lot, looking at the closed pizza place and its hemoglobin lettering. I couldn't ask Arthur a question. He'd just reply with a yes or no. Or worse, a mere hand gesture. So there we sat, in LA's desert cold, the engine off. I thought of hemoglobin, thought of blood goblins, of hemoghouls, of the way that the patient always puts us at risk. Not only with their blood, but with their peritoneal fluid, their synovial fluid, their amniotic fluid, their pericardial fluid, their cerebrospinal fluid. So much fluid that we are really just bodies of water. We're walking rain. We're storm clouds on the horizon. Arthur's snoring felt like fingernails running down a chalkboard. No... More like fingernails strolling down a chalkboard, taking its time, ready to panic. I wondered if Arthur would be the first death of the night. I was trapped in my mind for Christmas, the mess of Christ that's my life. Being an EMT is a cross between a janitor, a chauffeur, and a very stupid doctor. Being an EMT is a cross, it's a crucifix. 
No one was dying. Or they were dying, but alone, safe in hospital rooms with no nurses nearby. The nurses at home, playing Santa, playing records, playing solitaire. I thought of the origins of St. Nicholas. On my phone, I did an internet search, finding out that back in the old days, the European hills used to be filled with fires and wheels set ablaze. Trials were postponed. The criminal guilty would be hanged later. They waited for their death throughout Christmas. St. Nick was condemned as a devil in 1680, ruled to be in alignment with Satan, the view that he was taking the emphasis away from Christ. I didn't believe in anything except medicine, and even with that, I had my skepticism. My phone died, low on battery. The black mirror of the sky reflected my insides. We were close to midnight. I went into the back to lie down. The ambulance was the oldest one the company had. The paramedics got the good ambulances. The rite of passage was dealing with broken sphygmomanometers, bent gurneys, panels that refused to slide without force. I wondered how many patients had died back here. Years of useless cardiopulmonary resuscitation or in corpses... Decades of uncontrolled bleeding. The blood must be up to my neck by now. I'm drowning in patience. The panic attack came on quickly. It felt like trying to swallow my tongue. FYI, it is impossible to swallow your own tongue. The foolishness of people who think epileptics might do so. But it felt like that. An inability to breathe just like the patients, so many who I've had. The nasal cannula that does nothing, the non-rebreather mask that does nothing, the bag valve mask that does nothing, the nothing that seems to help, the relaxation that is death. I don't believe in ghosts, on ghosts, under ghosts, none of that. To be even clearer, I don't believe that you see ghosts. I don't believe ghosts are external. I believe that ghosts are in our hearts. They're in lungs. There are cold ghosts of the ossicles and warm ghosts of the chromosomes. When you're truly haunted, the dead are in your blood. I couldn't see any ghosts. You can never see any ghosts. When I could feel them, there were footsteps inside of me, wind blasted, a church collapsing internally, Havor Nocturnus, night terrors, but not memory, the now, the New Agers tell you to be in the now, except now, not when they, a long list of they, are crawling. It's a long lineage of grandmothers who took their last breaths while EMTs rapped along to metal lyrics blaring through static alternating radio stations. I've witnessed so much boredom with the dying. You only put up a dramatic fight if the family is in the back of the ambulance. Otherwise, you work with the intensity of plumbers. We are essentially librarians for human beings. We sort you to different hospitals and the Dewey Decimal System of the morgue. We do what needs to be done, and nothing more. We are legally bound to stay within the confines of our training. We cannot do magic. We watch patients die and take thorough notes of their death. There's no magic in that. But there is voodoo in their return. My skin is bubbling. I wish I could tell you the story of my body, but it's private. It's a haunted house. One in five Americans suffers from mental illness, so maybe you know what I'm talking about. When the ghosts are in your attic. When the ghosts are in your attic. All the windows are locked. You're having an in-your-body experience. And then it's her. Or him. I couldn't tell the sex. The person we transported who went through the windshield. No seatbelt. 
landed on pavement and slid face down the length of a football field. The shirts, the shorts, all torn through. The face was eradicated. You don't transport a patient like that prone. You put them supine, so they're staring at you. Except the eyes were taken by road. I see a face that's not a face. And that face is in my skull. Frontal. Cortical. Limbic. I can feel myself being suffocated by them. All the patients who took last breaths. And now, they want mine. I'm about to die by the hands of the imaginary. I can feel the past tense becoming present. I can feel the gift of strangulation. Hands inside the neck. The radio comes on. Someone has died. Someone has died and saved me. They run. They hide. They return. The back of the ambulance once again smelling like bleach diluted in water. The ambulance looked like a prison cell diluted in the hospital. I go back up front, clawing, almost fully drained. The hollow, the fresh hollow of the living. I take a breath and punch the radio button to take the call. You've been listening to Ambulance Means Walking, Christmas Means Dead, by Ron Rieke. Raz T. Slasher is an upcoming independent horror actor and writer. When he's not killing people, he co-hosts the Twisted Geekdom and Twisted Tales podcasts with his best friends. Ron Rieke wrote Up, a novel, and edited The Way North, collected Upper Peninsula New Works, 2014 Michigan Notable Books, Here, Women Writing on Michigan's Upper Peninsula, 2016 Independent Publisher Book Award, and And Here, 100 Years of Upper Peninsula Writing, 1917 to 2017, Michigan State University Press. Upcoming books include Undocumented. That's the title of the book. I, it is actually documented. Also by Michigan State University Press, co-edited by Andrea Scarpino. Post-Traumatic, from Four Chambers Press and Hootwaddle. And a book on the Evil Dead franchise, published by McFarland, co-edited with Jeff Sartain. He's acting in the upcoming films Short Straw, directed by Steve Balderson, and Flesher, directed by John Johnson. You can find him on Twitter at Ron Rieke. That's R-O-N-R-I-E-K-K-I. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, 
when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness. I bet you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill unless otherwise noted. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Felipe Ojeda under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's logo was created by Craig Groshek, and this week's artwork provided by Omega Black, unless otherwise noted. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for hundreds of free audio horror stories, including more performances from yours truly, and consider supporting us by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, I'm Jason Hill, and you've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast. Good evening, and sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.